narcissism. Well, you know, this is, this word has become so ubiquitous that it's one of those things that have kind of, um, in some ways, lost its meaning, not in terms of we all kind of know what narcissism means, but it's it's lost the specificity that we actually need in understanding narcissism and knowing how to deal with narcissism when it appears. Huh. So what does that mean? Well, basically it means this. Um, I got a call on the show one day and said, well, my therapist said that my husband is a narcissist and so they never change and blah, blah, blah. I said, stop, just stop. First of all, what kind of narcissist is he? And she goes, what do you mean? I said, what kind is he? They're not all alike. I mean, it's sort of like saying, uh, you know, hey doc, I got a pain in my gut. Well, you know, all pains in the gut, no. There are different types of things that cause what we see on the outside as and on the inside with people that exhibit narcissistic traits. So broadly speaking, broadly speaking, and I could go into the history of the psychology of studying narcissism and treating narcissism and all the variations that have happened through uh, basically probably the last six or seven decades which is when uh, treatment of narcissism really began to, to become a focus in the field of psychology. But instead of going into all that, um, which basically gets past the symptom and to the root cause, now by cause, I don't mean etiology, in other words, how it developed. I mean the cause when you see narcissistic traits is a narcissistic personality structure, okay? A character structure, the way somebody is actually glued together, just like your house. Some people have have one story, two stories. Some people have tri-level add-ons. There's a den over here, there's plumbing, there's blah, 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 blah. Well, all narcissists are not wired the same. But broadly speaking, here's what I want you to be aware of. Now, this is not perfect, and don't go diagnosing people for any kind of big thing other than, you know, uh, you need some clues sometimes as to what you're dealing with to know what to do. But here's kind of the two types. We know, and everybody knows from... Um, from watching and dealing and being in a relationship or reading about narcissists, that one of the things that's true about both types is that they have a grandiose sense of their own importance. Like they're really, really important. That comes with a lot of entitlement. It comes with a lot of sometimes braggadocio, braggadocio, is that a word? They brag a lot. You know, they're, they just are better than everybody else, right? And generally, they have subtle or not so subtle ways of letting you know that. And basically, that better than, above others, superior to kind of stance can come from two different sources, two different kinds of characters. One of those is the type that basically has the worst wish that a being can ever have, and I say being, not human, because we know way back at, you know, if you read the Bible, the the fall of Lucifer, even though he had all of these wonderful traits, a guy created him so beautiful and wonderful and brilliant and all of that, he somehow developed a wish that he wanted to be God. He wanted to be above. He wanted to sit in the chair of the Most High. It's the wish to be God that drives one kind of narcissist. I mean, what I mean by God is the wish, the actual I will be, and then it turns into the very systonic belief. A systonic belief is something that we don't have a conflict with that they are. And if you don't believe it, they're going to show you. 
and they're going to drive for it and they're going to achieve it and they're going to buy and sell and ruin and oppress others in a family or a company or society in order to be what they are because they really believe this. Now, wish to God, wish to be God is fueled by something called envy. And envy is probably the vilest emotion or stance or passion that we can have. It will absolutely ruin our lives and everybody else's life. And so when somebody is dominated by envy the, because they are going to be, see, what does envy do? It says what I don't have is what's good. So I'm going to go after everything I don't have. Power, fame, money, position, relationships, all of that. Well, that one's pretty tough. Okay. And the way you deal with that one is very different than what I'm going to call the second type. The second type, you also see a strong desire for grandiosity, to be cool, to be better than, to show how cool they are, to have an image where everybody is looking at them and thinking they're cool, and they'll do a lot of things to try to show you how cool they are. Unlimited success and power and brilliance, or even searching for ideal love. A lot of times you see narcissistic people idealize someone, they're in a relationship, but they idealize someone else than the one they're married to or dating. And that one becomes what? The one that I don't have and the one that I want. And they devalue the one that they used to think was so great. And they become worth nothing. They discard them and go for the second one. And they can have a string of these. So you see all the same kinds of narcissism. They believe they're special. They feel like they're entitled to a certain kind of treatment when they don't get it. They are really upset. <clears throat> sometimes they, uh, it's not sometimes, a lot of times they really show uh, a great lack of empathy for others. Empathy is a big deal here in both of these. But the second type doesn't have that core of God belief. What they have is a core of, for lack of a better word, let's call it shame. And maybe in their developmental years, they were put down and shamed and made to feel below or bad. And what they did is a as a defense against feeling like they're so little and bad and powerless and unwanted, they kind of split all that off and they're going to achieve, okay? And they're going to be bigger. And they develop this kind of uh, stance in life to pursue the ideal image of themselves to put out into the world. And they want others to reflect that. And so as long as you think they're wonderful, you can be the best friends ever, sort of, until you don't. Could you try to give them some feedback and tell them where something's not good or say something that doesn't flatter them because they just thrive on flattery then they get deeply wounded. Their woundedness may come out in anger. It may come out in a withdrawal into shame or covert narcissists, a lot of really controlling martyrs, you know, people, you know, poor so-and-so they're martyring the whole family with a bunch of guilt. Well, that's covert narcissism. I mean, it's still all about them, right? They're trying to control people. But the difference in the second one is they are deeply vulnerable, deeply vulnerable. The first one, you're not going to see any vulnerability at all. I mean, it's the difference between, um, and I'm not casting uh, shade here on any any particular uh, breed. <laughs> I love and those of you follow me um, and have, you know, been tuning in for a long time, decades really, you know, I love big working dogs. Um, I've raised, I think, five German Shepherds and a Rottweiler Doberman. And now we have a Doberman. And um, one of the things about the 
you see this with Dobermans, you see it with German Shepherds, you see it with Pit Bulls. Some of them, a lot of them, in fact, I, Finley, the one we have now is the first Doberman, full, full, full bred Doberman that we've ever had. This dog is Velcro. She is the biggest lover. You cannot sit on the couch and she's going to be right there. I mean, she just is a lover, 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 lover. But it's interesting when people come over, um, she does her job. She's also a watchdog. And if she, if she knows you, she'll be wagging her little tail about that long. And she will can't wait for you to get in the door. She's going to lick your face if she's allowed to. But until she knows somebody, she's going to come to the door and let you know that you're not coming in unless you get an okay from somebody here. Well, it's so interesting um, because if you've ever known any of those, really the breeds that are, you know, sometimes trained to be attack dogs. They get a, you know, they get a sort of a, a, a view about them, you know, a perception about them. And I have people come over and they see her and, and they get kind of freaked out because they just assume she's one of those. Well, narcissists are like this as well. There are some, we're talking about vulnerability is what I'm talking about here. There are some of these very specifically trained attack dogs. You will never see vulnerability. They are trained to go for the jugular. You talk to Finley, I can look at her crooked like, no. And you see her ears go back and sort of like she's on a guilt trip. But she can show the strength as well. Now, here's where I'm saying all this in these two types. If you're dealing with somebody that uh, really has a toxic, malignant wish to be God and anybody gets in the way or thwarts them, um, they are going to get in some way. Stay clear. That's where that's where the phrase sometimes in you know divorce attorneys, um, that's where the phrase where the person going through the divorce or one of those people learn the phrase, I'm sorry, but I will only talk to you through my attorney and you hang up the phone. See, that's what walls of protection are for. And so how do we see this? Well, you see it in, in when somebody into retaliatory behavior, that if they feel like, you did something to them. They're not like wounded and kind of like bummed and maybe won't talk to you or this or that. No, they are going to get you. They want to hurt you. That's when you need to take protection. On the vulnerable side, a lot of times there's a lot we can do. I, I, I hate it when I hear like that caller say, well, you know, narcissists don't change. That's just not true. Not all narcissists change. Sometimes we even wonder what it would take. But I've seen a lot of them change, especially the ones that are the shame-based ones, because if you can get to a place with them where they can begin to feel safe enough over a period of time and see modeling of other people being more vulnerable, and this happens a lot of ways. This happens with long-term therapy. It happens sometimes with some good coaches and other people that they esteem who can show them how to be vulnerable and they, they start to feel loved and accepted, then they gradually can begin to shed the grandiose self. Not all of them. Some of them are going to hold on to it, but I'm telling you, I've seen too many of them change into really wonderful people because they're covering up for a real self. So how do we know? Well, First of all, you got to run from danger. If somebody's malignantly trying to harm you, limits, 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 limits. Sometimes on the other side, what we can do in the right setting with the right influence is we can ease somebody into putting their toe in the water of vulnerability, and that's an open door. And many times those relationships can get a lot better.
So this isn't a one size fits all. I'm not suggesting you go jettison everybody that reacts narcissistically, I'm saying to use a lot of discretion and a lot of counsel, I'll probably talk to a good counselor. But I am saying that in general, we shouldn't put all people into one bucket when there are really several sub buckets in this diagnosis. Now, maybe in a future show, um, I'll go into a little bit about what do we do with them. <laughs> and let, let me say this, please, please hear me on this or you'll miss out on a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to almost say there's a third category. Let's just call it insecure people that kind of try to look good, you know, and they can only go outside when they are dressed perfectly or, or they want to get the fancy car. So somebody thinks, and, and they're just, it's kind of the chain based one a little bit, or they had that kind of modeling or whatever. Um, but there's nothing really dangerous. It's just kind of funny. And I say that to say, let's, let's call that a subgroup of the second group. <laughs> These are probably a lot of your friends. I mean, I have a lot of friends that I love and adore and love spending time with them. Some of them are the funniest people in the world. Now, I would hate to want to get rid of everybody that shows narcissistic traits because there's a lot of really good people in that bunch. It's just, you, it, there's only, you, you know, you got to have a level of relationship with somebody that they're able to have. So there's going to be some limitations sometimes on the depth, but some of them can really show up for you. Some of them can really be on your side. So don't judge all narcissistic traits as you've got a full blown, either malignant narcissist or entrenched narcissist. Um, narcissism as itself, you want to go back to the kind of self-esteem movement, you know, a lot of people have bad self-images and we need, there's something in developmental psychology called healthy narcissism. And what that is, it's an investment of a positive love for, with, about yourself. So you and I can't make it through the day if we don't have some good feelings about ourselves, right? We get depressed. I'm not talking about grandiose or narcissistic or whatever, but I'm talking about healthy narcissism is where, you know, hey, I'm pretty good at this. Hey, I can do this. I'd hate to be on a team with a quarterback that didn't have some healthy narcissism and think they could throw that pass or, you know, be, be married to somebody who just didn't have some healthy narcissism means they feel good about themselves. And when you say they didn't do something well, they don't get all upset. Why? Because they're carrying around a lot of good feelings about themselves, not shame nor grandiosity. So... Lots to talk about. I hope that um, gets some good discussions going in your head.